Okay, welcome back to our live coverage of the United Nations Climate Talks here in Durban, South Africa. Apologies for the delay to our start, um, but uh, I'm glad to say we've got the technical gremlins out of the system now, I hope. Um, I'm delighted to have been joined by uh, Martha Shushena Rojas of uh, Care International. You're the head of global advocacy there. Martha, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> yes, you did well, and it's a challenge. <laughs> Thanks very much. So um, I just want to start off by asking you to kind of um, give a quick insight as to what's going on here. What are the United Nations Climate Talks? Mm -hmm. This is a very important forum because this is where all the countries get together to agree on the action that needs to be taken for to address climate change. Mm -hmm. And because climate change is a global issue, it mm -hmm. cannot be sorted out by one country or two countries, so it really needs a place where agreement can be reached so that action is taken collectively, which mm -hmm. is the only way to address this global problem. Okay. And I know that you've, you've, before working for Care International, you were, you were actually uh, um, working on the delegation of Colombia as well. So maybe uh, an insight, what, what's actually happening at these talks? What are the different country groups doing? What, what's happening at the negotiations? Yeah, so the different groups are representing the interests of their countries. And this is why this process is very challenging, because you need to reconcile the interests and needs and priorities of each country. Mm -hmm. So each delegation comes with some positions on what they can agree in terms of what they need uh, in order to move forward. So mm -hmm. if you are a developing country, you are going to come to some interest so that you can get support to adapt, to mitigate climate change. Mm -hmm. If you are a developed country, you are going to be coming with a different agenda because you are the one who's supposed to be reducing emissions given your historical responsibility. Mm -hmm. You are also be expected to be providing resources. So. It's each delegation comes with its own position according to what the needs are of their people. Mm -hmm. And uh, these talks have been going on for almost 20 years now. And um, can you give us a sense of, of the progress over, the, over that time? Has it been enough? What's been happening over the last three, uh, few years? Mm -hmm. Well, the, this convention was uh, signed at Rio, and mm -hmm. we are going to have next year Rio Plus 20. Mm -hmm. So it was agreed together with two other conventions, and that was a major achievement in terms of getting all the countries agreed to take collective action on the main environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So since, there has been a lot of meetings, there has been progress in several areas, but what I think is compelling is that at the time, the science was not so clear as it is now, mm -hmm. and somehow, we know now that climate change is happening, that it's caused by humans, but then the progress has been slower than what the science is telling us that we need to do. So although some areas have progress, I think that overall the progress has been really, really slow and we are really needing to take action now. Okay, so just before we move on to talk um, about some of the experiences that CARE has in, in tackling climate change, I want to ask you about this week specifically. Do you have a sense of what the big issues are this week or, or what are people working on here? Yes, of course, the, the convention covers many areas. Um, it's a complex international agreement that tries to deal with the different issues. But here in Durban, there is urgency to achieve and to consider some very prominent areas. One is the future of the Kyoto Protocol. So when the convention was adopted, later on, a specific protocol was signed to get some commitments for developed countries to reduce their emissions because climate change is caused by emissions so there was an agreement to reduce the emissions according to certain targets so we are in a time where the commitments are going to expire mm -hmm. it's not that the kyoto protocol is going to expire mm -hmm. so there is a need to renew this commitment and to have a second period so that's the first thing that needs to happen the second is that the convention has also identified the need to have a comprehensive agreement mm -hmm to be negotiated for the longer term. So there has to be here a mandate for countries to negotiate that agreement. Mm -hmm. And the third area is finance, because adapting, especially for poor countries, require funding. And also taking action when you are a developing country that is trying to develop, then you need to get also finance. So these are three very important things that need to be covered and agreed to here in Durban. Okay. And you work for, for Care International, and obviously they're on the ground, they're working on the ground around the world. What kinds of impacts to climate change are you seeing? Yes. CARE is a confederation of 12 members and we work in more than 80 countries. So it's really an organization that is working on the ground with communities to alleviate poverty, to respond to emergencies. And what we are seeing in CARE is that the impacts of climate change, and this is something that everybody knows now, 
are really affecting most and hardest the poorest people, the most vulnerable people, which is quite unfair because they didn't do anything to change the climate change. So what we are seeing is, for example, if um, I look at a specific case that we were looking at uh, now, is the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. There has been a major, uh, major emergency in terms of food, mm -hmm. with the areas declared in, 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 in terms of famine, and these are, have been caused by drought, which is something that happens normally. But what is happening now is that the, the cycle of droughts is becoming more frequent. So for example, in Ethiopia, we are working with a community uh, in, in Borana, and what they are telling us is before the droughts would come every seven, eight years, now it's every one or two years. So the last ones were two years, one year ago and two years ago. So what that means is that communities don't have the time to recover, to replant their seeds, to feed the cattle. So they start in a circle where they don't have anything else to do than migrate and try to find food somewhere else. So we are seeing, for example, in Niger, Niger where there was a food uh, insecurity situation in 2010, that there are, there are signs that we may have another one now. So it's only two years after the first one. So what we are seeing is that people are really affected by these climate uh, disturbances and it also happens with rain in other places or even in the same places the rain has become erratic so the crops are destroyed and the people are really suffering and really even dying because of that but if the impacts are being seen around the world now if the science is as clear as as everybody seems to say it is a bar a tiny minority why isn't things why aren't things moving forward why isn't anything happening why does it feel so slow here that's uh, the question. Why is it that this is not being taken seriously? But again, I think that this is a matter of uh, interest groups, of lobbying, of industries, um, and it's um, a lack of willingness to take the necessary action because it has costs. And we have to say that we're in a situation now where the global economy is in problems, but that doesn't justify that during all these years nothing is happening. So developed countries are trying to go backwards now in terms of what they had committed and they want to commit less. Um, some developing countries have developed strongly and are emerging economies, so developing, developed countries want them to also take action. Mm -hmm. So there is a political dimension to it, but also uh, a dimension about uh, taking, having the will mm -hmm. to do what it has to take, which is not free and which costs. So there is also um, a situation in terms of the national domestic agendas and we know that the US, which is such an important country, is very weak now in terms of the domestic agenda for climate change. So that also makes it very more difficult to get agreement here, but doesn't justify. <laughs> but as, as somebody with experience kind of in the negotiating halls, as somebody who's been on kind of both sides of this fence, you've, you've worked for a, a huge advocacy organization and you've worked as a negotiator, what, can you give us an insight from, from the other side, if you like? Why, why are countries obstructing these talks? Why, why is it not more of a collaborative effort to, to, make, you know, to push, the, push the agenda forward here? Yes, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, is, um, this is uh, related to national interests, lobbying groups, um, and the fact that it's easier to see how to escape the, the actions that need to be taken. And for example, the convention has some mechanisms that uh, allow you to offset some uh, uh, emission reduction so that instead of doing, reducing your emission, you can do something else. Mm -hmm. So there is um, um, a trend in trying to avoid having to make the effort. So it's somebody else has to do it. Uh -huh. So I think that that's part of the, of the difficulty. Okay. And just in terms of, uh, for our viewers joining us, this is the first day that we've been webcasting live from the conference. What do you think they can expect over the next two weeks? What should they look out for? What would be, what would represent uh, a success here in, in Durban? Well, as I mentioned, these, in these three issues that I mentioned at the beginning, is that there is movement agreement in terms of the second commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol, that there is a mandate to negotiate the long-term agreement, and that there is funding. There are other issues, and CARE actually is working more in terms of the adaptation agenda, or the RED, which is reduction of emissions from forest degradation, which is try to use the potential of the forest to capture uh, carbon. Um, although we are working on that, and some progress may happen in these technical areas, the big issues are the three that I mentioned. If this doesn't happen, there is a problem in terms of the timing, 
because the Kyoto Protocol needs to, I mean, if there is an amendment, it needs to be ratified, so it will take time. So there are some issues which are urgent in terms of the action needed, but also in terms of building the trust so the rest can be carried out. And we know that next week the, the politicians are, are due to arrive here, the, the ministers. Is that when we'll have a sense of, of kind of whether there's potential for success here or not? Or are we already kind of, uh, you know, do we already have a, an insight into well, the progress here? The expectations for Durban are that progress needs to be made, but nobody expects that everything will happen here. So they are looking already to the following cup. But there has to be some level of agreement in the areas that I mentioned. And the negotiation started now, and it's really getting into speed. Um, what happens is that before the ministers come, the negotiators try to get as much as an agreement as possible, but then there are some critical issues that are left for the ministers to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So we will see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Martha, thank you so much for speaking to us. It's been uh, really interesting to have your insight. And maybe we'll pick up with you um, sometime later in the negotiations to try and get an idea of what's moved forward in, in areas of adaptation and, and, and how these talks have progressed. That would be really helpful. But thank you for joining us now. We're going to go to uh, that interview now with Alden Meyer, um, who's going to tell you some of the, the big issues that you should be focusing on. Thank you.